I'm back. What have we got this time? Well, I hate to say it, but we've got a Line 6 Helix. And I say hate because it cost me nearly £1,100, and that's $1,500 or $1,600. So that's a lot of money just for a floor pedal, right? I could have bought a GT100 or something. <laughs> I don't know. But hey, hang on. I've been looking forward to this. I, and I, I can guarantee I have. I've been waiting since about... July or August <laughs> which is a long time that's uh, nearly two and a half months well I just hope it's all worth it the fact is that this is a bit of a breakthrough product hopefully some people say it's great others say well it's this missing and that missing what I'm going to do in this review uh, is I'm going to take this thing right apart I'm going to look it inside see what it's made of see what components are in there and then we're going to go and take a look at its operation in-depth operation and then later uh, I'll play some music and uh, we can hear what it sounds like so it's probably going to be one of the most in-depth reviews I've ever done and uh, God help if it's rubbish I'll say so but of course if it's good I'll say so too that's one of the problems you get when you watch these videos that they make, you know, the manufacturer. It's always going to look good. And then you get the videos of the guys that don't have proper cameras and things, so you can't really tell what's going on. And then you get me, rock and roll. I'll say the way it is. Remember that. It's a trusted review. Now, I've only just pulled this literally out of the box. I haven't even turned the thing on, so I know as much about it as you do, except to say... When you go and look at the box that it comes in, it's huge. And uh, I didn't like this this one either because uh, it had been previously opened, you know, sealed broken and all that rubbish. And I expected better from someone like Toman. Okay, so well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to whip the lid off or the bottom off or something off so we can see a bit inside. Just hold on. Well, I'm back. I've whipped the base off as well as much as I can get the base off. I'm going to have to do a lot of digging to get further, which is a real pity. Because I wanted to go really inside this and see what uh, the thing's made of. Now, I might strip it down further, but it's a pretty major piece of work to go much further than just taking this little back off. What a pity. Maybe I'll work a bit further. Well, what do you know? I got in there after all. Rock and roll. I can see the dual processors. Yeah. A bit like that other thing I saw, you know, the one that had all the bad welding. But on this one, there is no welding, it's all nice. It's all made exceedingly well. Two really nice cast aluminium ends. Cast of all things. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in, take a quick look at this, and uh, we'll do an analysis of the chips a little bit later. Yeah, I photographed them. I'm going to have some fish with them too, so let's zoom in. Take a look. Well, here we are. I'm taking a close look at this. Uh, yeah, well, you see plenty of PCB uh, real estate, but you don't see much uh, of anything else except this tiny little board in the middle. Obviously, there's a display at the other side of this box. Uh, so you get a display, you get the processing board, we'll call it that. There's not much the other side of this, which we've already looked at, but when I put it back, we'll take another look on camera. You've got the... Uh, the pedal section, which I suppose is what it is, but uh, apart from that, we're coming back to two uh, analog devices processors. Bit of memory, by the look of it. There's a, a Toshiba chip down here, and uh, I don't know what this other one is quite yet, but we'll find out a bit later. Just wanted to show you inside, and uh, what I'll do is I'll slap some pictures up on the uh, the video. Well, I'm talking about the chips a little bit later on because we are going to talk about the chips and what they do and only briefly but uh, enough so that you get a good idea a good feel of what this thing's all about because you know uh, 1100 pounds for something that's got a PCB on it about this size and some people will tell you that the process cost processes cost a thousand pound each yeah I'm sure they do yeah in your dreams anyway there's the board looking at the quality of this thing uh, the quality is exceptional now one of the little secrets that's been going on in China over the last few years is all these uh, manufacturers have got better and better and better at this 
in fact they're so good at it now that in, really when you look at this PCB and you look at the, the manufacturing it's all uh, surface mount but it's all exceptional quality you're not going to fault any of the quality on this uh, this PCB I think if there was anything that I could moan about if I wanted to moan <laughs> and I don't really want to uh, would be a tiny little power supply maybe that should have been I don't know, a little bit bigger maybe not because it's a switch mode power supply and they do push out a fair amount of current but unlike some of the units that I have seen in the past uh, regarding internal power supplies, some of them are really awful. This one's really put together very well and it's got all its uh, protection down there if you can see that. Well you can't from where you are I'm sure. Maybe you can now. Just there. In blue. Yeah, so what else can I say? Well, there's another chip under here which I'm going to get a picture of. I don't know whether we can really get to it very easily. Looks to me to relate to the screen driver or the screen display chip or something like that. I'll be talking about it and of course when you check the review out on my website uh, I'll have a section all about that little chip and what it does. Other things to note are these little uh, PCBs that are like uh, oh, switch, switches on, uh, on the top or you know, a, a volume or a, a, you know, some sort of uh, variable adjuster that sticks out the front over here. All very nice. I like that. The reason I like it is you get a problem with one arm, you can maybe never buy one, but <laughs> maybe you could make one. It's more down here too. Lots and lots of these little boards. It's all pretty good, really. I don't know whether you can see down here that's the foot pedal looks pretty well made and as you can see there the aluminium casing well it's a great big solid thick chunk of aluminium I would describe that as being at least a quarter of an inch thick six mil. here's a quick shot of the unit uh, when it's back together <sighs> well I'm back <laughs> see I bet you never thought I'd get that going again did you <laughs> You're wrong. I've been here before. One thing I do just want to say before I carry on is if you're one of these guys that likes to copy me <laughs> and make your own video and put it on the internet <clears throat> and pull yours apart, I'm telling you now you're going to have trouble putting it back. What I'm going to do is take a quick look around the back, show you what's around the back, show you what's around the front and then we're going to get down to the programming bit. Uh, but before that, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about them chips. One of the things I do want to cover are the, uh, the chips that are inside this uh, incredible pedal. Uh, some people might think that, uh, you know, maybe somebody like uh, Fractal Audio has the highest technology that there is. Well, I think this pedal goes some way to change that somewhat. And uh, it changes it at about half the price. So... Well, what exactly is in here? I mean, some of it might sound rather familiar. Now, I don't have all this at the top of my head, but when you get to the written review, you can absolutely be sure that uh, I'll be listing all this stuff and uh, maybe do comparisons with other products. Who knows? I'm just going to run through a few of the components uh, that make up this incredible machine and uh, have photographs of that for the, for the internet site, and I'll, no doubt they'll be blown up there. <laughs> was getting right. Okay, well, the main processors, funnily enough, are dual processors. That sounds familiar. And they're also analog devices. It says here, ADSP 21469 Shark processors, two of them. Uh, dual processors, as they say, or well, some do. Features and benefits, it says here, 450 meg core clock speed, 5 megabit on chip RAM. For uh, FFT accelerators, whatever that is, 16 bit wide DDR2 external memory interfaces. It goes on sample rate, fully enhanced DMA engine, including scatter gather DMA relay line, and two link ports, eight serial ports supporting I2S, left justified sample pair. On it goes. It's just page after page of this stuff about the processors alone. I won't bore you with all of it, but all I can tell you is it sounds rather familiar. Yeah, fancy that. 
Well, let's move on a bit further than just the processors because just the processors are in other products, aren't they? So then we have some support chips by uh, this particular one. <clears throat> is semiconductors, they're LPC 4300 series, actually the 4350s and they're Cortex uh, dual core uh, MCUs or microcontrollers and these things once again are <clears throat> quite incredible uh, the semi semiconductor series microcontroller based on the world's first asymmetrical dual core digital signal controller architecture features ARM, Cortex M4, Cortex MO processors these NXP Cortex MCUs with Cortex MO coprocessor bring the advantage of developing digital signal processing and MCU applications within a single architecture. What they mean is they take the whole pile of chips and throw them inside this. And this thing runs at 204 meg, it's 32-bit uh, ARM technology, which as some people might know, ARM technology comes from the UK in fact. I won't bore you again with it too much because the huge amounts of information but it will be on the website when I write that and uh, again I'll cover this in great depth. As well as this NXP chip, there's another support chip as well. Uh, this one is <clears throat> another Cortex-M3 microcontroller. This is an LPC1774 FBD144. And this one says here it's a microcontroller for embedded applications featuring a high level in integration, low power consumption, 120 meg. Features include 128K of flash memory, 40K of data memory, USB 2, 8 channel DMA controller, 4 UARTs, 2 CAN channels, 8 channels of 12 bit ADC, so it's an ADC, A to D, um, it's, a, yeah, it's a converter, <laughs> it's 10 bit DAC. Motor controlled, four general purpose timers, six output general purpose PMWs, ultra low power, real time clock, separate battery supply, up to 109 general purpose IO pins. So, that little thing there, you can see all the features about it. Again, it's going to be on the website. I don't have time to cover every last aspect in a video like this, so, you know, we have to do that. Let's move on to an old name that I thought had long died. Cirrus Logic. Now, if you've been in PCs uh, a long time, I did. I was in that for a very long time. Uh, here's Cirrus Logic. They don't make processors anymore, somewhat. Anyway, this one, uh, this chip here, it's a CS4272, and it's 24 bit, 192 kilohertz stereo audio codec. Again, once you read it, we've got diagrams and all the rest. You're just going to have to wait, really, until we get to the, the website. But, uh, Massive amounts of things that this chip does, and it's all in, all in there. Amazing. There's another one too, another Cirrus Logic chip. Let's get this one out. It has a different feature or function. This one's a CS5368. Now this is 114 dB, 192 kilohertz. It's an 8 channel A to D converter. Analog to digital. Well, you wouldn't need one of them, wouldn't you? And this system has it. It's the Cirrus Logic one. You're going to get to see it on the website. Yeah. There's also some Toshiba chips in there that I couldn't find much information on. Maybe they're too new or I, I don't know. Uh, let's not worry about them for now. Or maybe I'll name them, but uh, I can't tell you much about those. But there's also another sort of PC related uh, brand chip, a Winbond, if anybody's heard of them. I'm sure you have. This is a, it's a high speed synchronous dynamic RAM. Uh, module organized as 2 meg words, 4 banks, 16 bits. It delivers data bandwidth up to 166 mega words per second for different applications is sorted into different grades. Access to SD RAM burst orientated. It's clearly a memory access chip or controller of some kind. It's 166 megahertz it operates at by the way. Uh, that's all I'm going to tell you about the chips because the video doesn't handle this sort of stuff, but as I said, the review on the website will do. And uh, I'll be going into more depths and you'll be able to download the data sheets and uh, maybe even compare them to some other company's products. Who knows? Okay, so now you know all about the chips. That's interesting. Uh, let's take a look around the back. Just have a look at the I.O. You've probably seen it before, but we're going to cover it anyway for people who haven't. 
and uh, we'll take a look at the top in general and then we'll have a bit of a zoom in and uh, see how we program this this puppy well here we go another day another shirt rock and roll let's get back to this well I was about to flip the manual out to just take a quick look and uh, yeah there isn't one <laughs> That could be a bit of a problem on a product like this. It can be a little bit complex, and you'll see that a bit later when we get down to it. But uh, it comes with, uh, funnily enough, it comes with one of these. Uh, let me reach across. Yeah. It's one of them uh, stick things. So you stick it in your computer, and uh, maybe, just maybe, it's got the manual on. I'm going to go take a look, because I didn't read the paperwork like you won't. Let's go look. And sure enough, with the magic computer, you've got the uh, the manual uh, in Chinese, English, French, German, Japan and Spanish. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to vanish for 30 seconds and print off the manual. Because I'm like that. I hate looking at it and these little things like this. And we're also going to check out the, uh, the firmware that's in this thing compared to the latest firmware on line 6 and maybe I'll show you how we update that before we proceed. Now just before we move any further forward uh, there's one or two things that I like about the uh, the Helix right off the bat unlike some of the earlier line 6 stuff that I've uh, looked at. For starters there's no cut corners they actually throw in a 50 pence <laughs> It's not 50 pence, it's probably a bit more than that if you go and buy one in the street, but they've actually thrown in a USB cable, which will be nice when we come to the next thing, which is updating the, uh, the unit. It has to be plugged into a PC. They also supplied this thing that I spoke about earlier on that's got the manual on, but now I've been to uh, line 6 at this point here, right? That's where you go to download your software that you can put on your PC and then update this to the latest firmware. So we're going to go and do that in a minute. So there's a few things nice about the Line 6. Right out of the box it comes with a few bits and pieces that you can actually use. What it doesn't have is a printed manual, which I've gone and printed since we spoke a few moments ago. As you can see, there's actually 50 pages here and it covers an absolute mass of stuff. My recommendation is that you don't mess about, you go and get one of them cover things that I've got there, print them out so you've got a real reference manual because I would say that initially you're going to need it. Now these guys actually are very thoughtful because they do actually provide you with a cheat sheet, which is this big thing like this. You can see one side it's got everything about this side and on the back side, I could use another word, it's, it's got everything else and uh, one of the important bits about this when you start looking at this a bit later on is you're going to have to effectively remember all these processing blocks, output blocks and input blocks because that screen down there means nothing without these. But we'll come back to that later because we're going to cover a, a multitude of things in this review. Trust me, this will be probably the best review I've ever done, so it's all going to be cool. What I don't like about this is this should have been laminated in the box and that would have been nice. I'm going to have to go and laminate my own. But uh, apart from that, that's awesome. Yeah, really good. Massive improvement over the, uh, what was it, the pilot's book or something. These, ah, whatever it was. I crashed and burned every time. Anyway, let's move on. I'm going to install the firmware, the software on here, and the software on here will update this. Let's go and do that now. Okay, well firstly, here's how you check what firmware you've got in your, your Helix to start off with. You just simply turn it on. We shall see. This is version 1.01.2. How easy is that? And the firmware that's already... Uh, to be installed is version 1.02.2 and uh, that's in October 2015 probably updates on that you also need an account uh, from Line 6 to download that software so don't forget that when you go there they're going to ask you to make one of them the download uh, that I put down was uh, including new factory presets it was about 57 megabytes and uh, it's called Helix V1.install or whatever they call it maybe zip 
So you pull that down to your PC, which we're gonna do now, and take it from there. So uh, let's go look at that. Now what we have here is a standard PC. This one's running Windows 10. On the left here we've got the Helix itself, and I have a cable coming out the back that connects, or will connect, into the PC down there from the Helix. I've also got the uh, plugger in, all nice and simple. Oops. Highlighted is the file that we pulled down from uh, Line 6, and we'll just take that and drag it across to the desktop. There it is. Now I can disconnect the Helix flash drive. So here's the file we pulled down. Let's just double click that. Say yes. Install it. Do what it says. You do agree. I'm sure you've read all that. <laughs> so we'll just throw all this on here. Puts the drivers on as well, by the way. So it's all nice and straightforward. You can just do a straightforward click, click, click. Thanks very much. And away we go. Leave it all there. And finish. And there's the original program. And here's the data and the Helix, something or other that we'll have a look at. At the moment, it's the updater that we want to run. Okay, you've got to log in. I'm not going to show you that. You can see that it's saying running offline mode. So what I'm going to do, just by default, is to just plug this in down here. And away we go. Let it do its thing. You can see it's installing the device. All pretty simple, really. And there we go, it's finished. I'm going to rerun this again. And see that. Select device to update. You can see very clearly it tells you what version as well. So we select that. There's 10202, whatever it is. Update. I'm sure you're going to read all that. And all that. And there it goes. And that's what you see on the screen while the program's installing. It does take a little while. Uh, I estimated it at about five minutes, something like that. Firmware update tells you all about it. You can clearly see the firm, firmware version is updated to 102.2. So rebuilding the presets. You see them ticking away at the bottom because there are some new ones added in this version. And there's a quick shot just after it's updated. Now on the PC side of things, we've got this Helix program here that it doesn't really go into any much depth and talk about, but it's really a bit, looks a bit like a editor, librarian type of thing. There it is. I don't know if it's draggable. Don't know much about it yet. <laughs> Point is, you can see all of the various bits and pieces in there. There's things for presets import bundles, export bundles, there are impulses for the caps and things like that. We'll come back to this later. Well, there you have it, that's the firmware update. Nice and simple. In fact, it's pretty much one of the easiest ones I've ever done. It doesn't go wrong, it just installs and just works. How easy can it get? But that's one of the first things you need to do before you start twiddling around doing everything else with this unit. So the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to take a look at the back because there's quite a lot of I.O. on this uh, unit, which is actually quite important. And then we'll take a look at the top with the, you know, the necessary buttons and the rest. Have a look at what some of them do and have a look at some of these presets and things like that. Uh, it's all going to be quite interesting. So hang on. Here's the back. Let's start taking a look at this in no particular order across the back of the unit. First of all, you've got this. EXP2 and EXP3. Now these are for extra expression pedals that you can assign different things to. These are really great. If, For example, you might want to have uh, something simple like a reverb that can get into a cavern from being 
something little and tiny. You could put a pedal on there and assign that. And the same with expression three. Do whatever you like. It's all nice. Okay, well this next one here uh, is for your external amp switching. Now, I find this a little bit frustrating because it just is one connector uh, for switching an amp. And if you've got something like a Mesa Boogie, this is absolutely pretty much useless. Uh, you'd want to do it by MIDI with other, other gear, same as I do. Uh, a one, one switch isn't, isn't really what you want. They say that you can use it to switch the reverb on your amp or switch one channel or this or that. Or, well, I guess you could, but to be honest, I think that's, that's very limited. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with this one. It's called a CV. And they say it's for basically connecting to an expression pedal input or stomp boxes on a CV control voltage inputs and voltage pedals or synths. Well, I don't have much to do with that. Unlikely I'll do anything on demonstrating that today. But uh, don't worry about it. That's what it's for. It's all easy. Now to the important bit, your guitar in. Now, it doesn't just have to be a guitar. You can have a bass guitar on this one uh, or, a, or a regular guitar, which is all good. And one of the things you can do is you can... Uh, you can pad this so that if you're using something like humbuckers, you can knock them back a bit on the input. Uh, or, you, or you can change the impedance of the, of the input, you know, what it sees. That's all useful too. Now we also have an auxiliary in, auxiliary in I'll get that wrong. And uh, with this one, they say you can, oh, you can put a second guitar or bass through that, you know, it's all exciting. Well, I can think of a thousand things you could put in that, and I'm sure you can too. Anyway, it's a second input. We've also got a mic in, which is nice because this one's uh, you can switch 48 volts on or not, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. So you could put in a, a, a sort of a condenser mic type of thing and uh, push that straight across to your PC into the door because you can do that on this unit. So uh, yeah, it'll stream the audio uh, into the door and back again, I guess. Moving along a bit, we've got these sends and returns. We've actually got four sends and returns, which could be really, really useful. Now, whether you're using uh, external pedals or whether you've got a rack or anything like that, you can bang in these loops, uh, drum machines, whatever you want, uh, all very useful and all switchable. And they're probably storable per preset. I haven't checked that yet, but I guess they will be. And when you are using uh, these I.O., you can get a problem where you get a load of hum off your other units, especially if they're being powered in some way. So this little button here, we can uh, switch in or out as a, as a ground lift, which will get rid of some of the hum. Oh, well, hopefully. Next in line are these XLR outputs. You've got a left mono and a right. Now these can go straight off into your PA. They can go off into the studio, uh, do a load of stuff with them. And uh, it's likely they'll have the speaker emulation turned on and all that. If you want it on, I guess it'll be turnable off if you don't. And we have a sort of equivalent in uh, quarter outs here, or 6mm. I think they are in uh, Euro, Euro Giggle. Uh, well, there it is. Uh, and, and the thing is, you can push these off to your amps, or amp. Uh, left mono, or left and right, depending on what you want. All nice. And next to it, very nicely, is the headphones. Uh, which I'm sure, well, some people will use all the time. Now, if you've got a Variax guitar, which I don't have, I'm afraid, so I can't demo that, this is where it's going to go. It uh, has audio in and puts a bit of power out there and all sorts of things. Great if you've got a Variax, not so great if you haven't. Obviously, they support Variax because it's line six. Now, we've got uh, a MIDI in and a MIDI out or through, uh, which I guess you can... Uh, mess around with on deciding what it is but uh, obviously if you've got external gear this is all very very useful stuff well if you haven't well it'll just sit there like everything else but I'm happy to see all that stuff on there next to it is a SPDIF or SPDIF I call it SPDIF uh, which is a digital IO uh, quite useful for getting across to your studio stuff or other gear uh, if it's got the requirement for that uh, some has some hasn't by the way, this is 75 ohm, which is a standard for SPDIF. It's also got an AES EBU out, uh, which you can push straight across to your recording desk and stuff like that. Uh, but you can also use it for Line 6 gear, you know, for their stuff, monitors and stuff like that. I've no experience of the Line 6 stuff, so uh, I've got a bit with AES EBU, so 
that's all good. And lastly, well not quite lastly, the last one's important too. Uh, this USB connector, you've seen that in action already and you know that we've got the uh, librarian so we can have a look at the, the settings and the parameters within the unit. It's all good. Lastly, most importantly, is the input power. Now what I like about this unit, it's uh, ready for it, it's, all, it's 100 to 240 volts so it doesn't matter where you buy this in the world, you buy it from the cheapest place you can because you'll plug it in, it'll work first go. Indeed, this one did not come from England. Well, now we're going to take a quick look at the top of the unit so we can get a bit of an idea what goes where and what doesn't and things like that. It all looks a bit confusing, especially at first with all this stuff up here. Hmm, yeah, we'll come back to that. You've got to remember a load of things to know exactly what these are. And that's one of the learning curves of the uh, Line 6 Helix. It's not just a simple matter, let's plug in and go, well, you could do that, but then you wouldn't be able to get the best benefit of the unit. So let's go and start at the corner and work our way around. It's all pretty easy, really. Okay, well, you've got the obvious thing here. This is a, a save button. So once we've done a bit of work in here, we can come and save it from this. Uh, you press it twice to save the changes, by the way, so, you know, nothing's lost with any of that. This next one along is like an advanced... Uh, command center or menu system that we can whiz along, we can choose with these. I'll come back to that later. That's what it does. This will always take you back home, as it says. If you get lost, we can go faffing around in here, but you can always get back to home simply. I like that. <laughs> now this next one, you can preview the amp and cab. Well, there it is on this one, uh, but it, you could also uh, preview the amp or the preamp tone stacks, things like that. Easy to get back. Oh, it didn't go there, did it? The knob in the centre is pretty obvious. We can whiz through various presets. Well, of course, you can do it this way as well. The simple way. The thing is, with these knobs across the bottom here, you can see they've all got titles, but you can also see but over here, you've got a number of pages, so we can whiz through the pages for different things. You can even change the sag and the amp and things like that. So we're going to these knobs. Uh, it's all good stuff. And as I said, we can go along and change a thousand and one things along here. Masses of stuff. Oh, three pages of it. Let's call it that. We'll come back to all this later when we uh, go and actually look at some presets. Now the unit has a, a sort of global EQ that you can apply and if you wanted to turn it off you just take this bypass and hold it in and that'll turn the global EQ on and off. But if we were to press it just once we can bypass the one unit and you can see that we're turning this on and off. See? All very simple. We also have an, an action panel here, an action button shall I say, that opens an action panel. So if I click that that opens the actions that we can use for this particular block, whatever it may be. We could have chosen any. And that puts it back. This is like a joystick, so we can sort of move around reasonably easy. Or self-explanatory, really. And we can move forward and backward on these pages like I showed you. A couple of obvious things. We've got a, a volume level. It's a bit like a hi-fi. <laughs> and a phone's level, which is also uh, pretty self-explanatory, really. Just one thing, that volume does actually uh, work for the quarter inches, the XLRs, the digital and the USB uh, 1 and 2 outputs, so bear that in mind. It's all getting easy now, isn't it? We're moving down to the easy stuff. Well, not quite. But uh, we've got uh, an up, up and down bank. We can whiz between banks, all pretty easy. You know what them do. And uh, you notice they're flashing, so we, we just hit the one and that one pops up and that chooses the next bank, for want of a better phrase. Well, pretty simple. Now these two buttons, this is FS1 and this is FS7, so it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. Just bear that in mind. Now when you're in preset foot switch mode, which uh, it's all simple, you preset and choose it, that's great. What you can also do is uh, use this in what they call stomp foot switch mode. 
But we'll come back to that once we've had a look at the modes. Let's take a look at the, uh, the tap button. If we hold that down, we get a tuner. There's the tuner. And just touch it again and you'll be back to where you were. But we also have this, this mode button up here. If we go into the uh, stomp foot switch mode, just touch this once. We can see that these blocks are assigned up here. So if I look at transistor tape, I can turn it on or off. And you can see that happening up here. One of the things you do have to remember is you have to really learn these uh, little, I don't know, units. <laughs> we'll call them that. But you can see it's being turned on or off. So you can see on it is, off it isn't. Nice and simple. But there is another mode. To get that other mode, what you do is you hold this down. Now what we're doing here is assigning the switch to the selected bit, if you will. So if I wanted to go and have a look at this looper mono, I can click that. And I can change all the various features to do with that particular parameter. And then I can save them. Exit, hold to save. Hold to save and exit. So if I just hit it once, I can exit without saving it. But uh, it would save it if I held it. If you just hit it once, you're back out. We can come back to where we were. So once you get used to this, this sort of touch and hold, and or just lightly touch, it's all pretty straightforward, really. It's lightly hold. Oh, Looper 63. Well, I'm on Unit 2 now. So we could have a look at this. We can loop it once. We, there's a thousand things we can do. We're coming back to most of this later. Yeah, always remember that no matter what you're doing and how complex this may seem, you can always get back to home, which is here. It's a great use, great button that is. Lastly, one of the things that Line 6 promote quite heavily on this unit is this, press this and edit it with your toes. So if we did that, we can come and edit all of this, literally with your feet. I don't ever see a use personally to do that, but... Uh, that's one of the features that's promoted. Next I'm going to look at the editing, then I'm going to look at the librarian. We're going to have another bit of a closer look at some of these buttons and things that we can change. And of course, uh, later on I'm going to be playing it. <laughs> it should all be good. Uh, but that will be much later in the day, or indeed in the night at this rate. I've uh, been on this for a, a day or two in, in fact. So let's go and take a closer look now at this section up at the top, uh, where there is a, you know, it's a preset, it's defined, it's all there, and uh, we, can, we can decide what these little uh, meaningless little squares are and uh, how to use them and things like that. It should all be very exciting actually, and it's part of, you know, uh, the fun of uh, when you buy one of these things. It isn't all just about purely playing. Well, it isn't for me. It might be for you. If it is for you, where well, you don't want to know any of that stuff, you can just use the presets and do a little bit of twiddling here and there with your drive, bass, mid, treble, and things like that. But there are other guys that get really into this stuff and want to get down into uh, those cabs and, and all that stuff. Me, I'm not so much on the cabs because I don't have time of day for it, but I'm going to run through it anyway. So that's coming up next. Whoa! One of the things I did want to uh, to mention that I didn't talk about earlier uh, was to do with this preset. If we hit the preset button by clicking it, we can see that there are factory presets one and two, user presets, and also templates down here. Now you can move up and down with this thing, and you can hop across and move up and down like so. We can whiz into the templates. Now these are things that have been preset, uh, you know, by the manufacturer for you to just pull in and then uh, hack around with, which saves an awful lot of time. I just wanted to cover that, and if, when we want to get out of that, you just simply press this and you're back to where you started. All very nice and easy. Just make sure when you're finished, we can just whiz back 
to where we started, factory one. One A, and we're back to where we were. In fact, the unit can store, uh, I think, something like 1,024 different settings. So uh, you've got a bit to go at. <laughs> now also consider this, that these effectively are like set lists. So you could set up a whole pile of set lists, uh, depending on where you're playing and what you're playing and all the rest of it. So there's a mass of things you can do with that, uh, if you think about it. Uh, different set list for every gig and all that stuff. Now one of the first things you want to do with this uh, equipment when you get it is to set the proper output levels and uh, it's all pretty simple really. If you press this we can go and have a look at uh, global settings. Now we've got the ins and outs. We've got the uh, guitar in padding if we want to make that you know so that the humbuckers don't have quite the drive. The impedance, mic in, mic and gain, all that sort of stuff. And you can probably whiz across these for the outputs too. I'm not going to sit here doing it all because I could be here forever. <laughs> well, that's basically where you'd set your global settings. What you would do though, uh, if you were setting this into a guitar amp, we'd whiz along until we see quarter outputs and then we'd set that to instrument like so. Line, instrument, very simple. And go back like that. Now one of the weird things about uh, most of these type of pieces of equipment is you tend to have a lot of displays like this with these various, uh, they call them blocks. You can see them here, different little things on these lines which is a path of the uh, signal. And uh, we can adjust those. So the problem with this is that there are loads of these different little types and some of them look a bit similar we can whiz across but it does tell you what it is so if we were to go to that one we've got a volume pedal as you can see we've got a valve drive you can whiz across all these things you can turn them on or off as well quite easily we can choose them uh, we could change that if we wanted to all you want to do is just go back if you're not sure Look at that one, that's a reverb. Look at this one down here, when we get there. Amp and cab, we could click it. And we can do a bit of choosing there. There are loads to go at, absolutely loads. I might talk about that a bit later. Always whiz back, just simply with this button here. Let's imagine we wanted to change this in some way and add a new block or a new feature. We can whiz around with this. You just turn it and they'll all pop up one after the other. So you don't really have to think too much. There is a lot. Okay. Let me carry on. You'll notice that the little block has changed to a different type of uh, icon. Another one. You can see it goes on and on and on. Very much like some of the other stuff out there, some of which cost twice as much, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Simple matter to get rid, just rewind it <laughs> and it's gone. If we whiz across here, this is the input. This is set up for multi guitar, auxiliary, variax, or whatever. If you press the joystick, you'll see a number of different choices. That this could be set to. Multi's the standard, if you will. We whiz across down here and across, across, across. Oh, I'm getting worse. Uh, you can see the output and we have a number of choices for the output too. So it's very flexible on where it's coming from and where it's going to. Uh, I like that sort of thing, nice and easy. You can see that there's, there's not really much involved here, is there? And when we're back down here and we want to add a new basically a, a new block we could just hit this choose one of these let's say a delay mono or stereo and then we can 
Whiz down all the ones that are pre-stored. It's all really very, very simple. So if I just wanted multi-tap six, I'd hit that. And now we've got a multi-tap six right there within this uh, preset. If we wanted to change that, we just go back in here. We could say, well, what do we want to look at? And there are all these things down here. We've got an amp and cab. Let's go for a guitar. Yeah, well, there aren't many to choose. Let's choose that one. It's in there. You've got two of them now. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We can see down here, we've got the amp and the cab. It's not like that. A whiz across. And you can see all the various things that relate to this amp and cab. Loads of stuff. What if you wanted to move a block? Well, it's all pretty simple. You press the action button and we can say copy, clear, clear all. But well, we can just move that block backwards and forwards to wherever we want and then we can put it down. Job done. Now, the action button here actually allows us to do a load of other stuff as well. We can clear a block, we can clear all the blocks, we can copy a block. So we can, we can set something up new uh, really, really simply uh, from fresh. Or we can just, don't forget, we've got those other things that are preset for us that we could just load. Templates. What we've got here is a little simple example of what's called a, a parallel, re parallel routing as opposed to serial routing. Serial's one line. Parallel is this one. So what they did was to... You can uh, action that and you can sort of move it back up so that brings it back into serial but if we just press it down again it's now in parallel you can go back to home to save that preset when you finish just press save and we can go and edit this with all the the knobs i don't want to mess around with that all day but it's all pretty simple to do and when you've had enough you're back to where you were it's also possible to take these uh where these merge here you can split them or merge them and you can make more parallel routings. By that I mean press the action button here and now we can take that split off and move it down to a fresh parallel connector for want of a better word. Or we can position it anywhere else we like. I'll put it back where it was for now but you get the idea. All pretty simple. It's also possible to set up what they call a true parallel path which means that you could have vocals on one of the paths and you could have guitar on another path with completely independent uh, uh, effects and things like that. There's one other thing you can do and that's called a super serial. And where we have these blocks like this, we can squirm around all the way down the screen. And believe it or not, you can have up to 32 blocks. Uh, that assumes the DSP can handle all 32 blocks of what you choose. Of course, there are some limitations on some of these things, uh, in particular when you're talking about things like amps and things like that. And a good example, uh, or should I say a good reference point, is uh, you can have any combination of up to four of these amp and cab, amp or preamp blocks. Uh, that's two per path. Now if you wanted uh, cab blocks, including amp and cab in blocks, you can have up to four of those, two per path, uh, cab, dual blocks and Dual blocks are considered as two. And then we've got impulse response blocks. Well, now we can have up to four of those, and that's 1,024 point IRs. That's two per path, or two 2,048 point IRs. That's one per path, if you do that. Also, with the looper block, you can only have one. Now, it all sounds a bit confusing, but it isn't. Because if you press the joystick, you can see a list of things down here. Let's choose one of them. And if you couldn't use it in the current situation, let's say this one, it'd be greyed out. Let's see if we can find one of them that's actually greyed out. Uh, I'm hard enough. Yeah, you can see we can use the top one, but we couldn't use the two second ones. And that's a limitation of the DSP itself. Even though there's two processing engines in this product. And one thing you want to keep in mind when you're using uh, stereo is the order that you put these blocks and the, the particular type of block that you use 
does vary the stereo imaging somewhat so you've just got to be a little bit careful with that and maybe use some headphones if you really want to get a great uh, stereo sound now I'm back but just while we're talking about blocks what you've got to understand is there are loads and loads of blocks that you can use in that setup it's a bit like uh, one of them other things that costs double the money uh, but the thing is about it is you've got to get used to the blocks and the symbols for the blocks otherwise you're going to go round in circles but the good news again is that if you look at the blocks we have a few for the input I don't know if you can see them from there I'll probably put them on screen you've got a few for the output but then you move on to a whole pile of effects blocks that we can use I'll put some of these up there while we're talking about them in general right now uh, you'll see them somewhere over oops that side of the screen uh, I always get that wrong <laughs> and just looking at them we've got distortion models minor to compulsive drive valve driver well I'll read the real ones out clone cent centaur full turn OCD Chandler tube drive these are distortions proco rat orbiter fuss face electro armor zvex on and on it goes there are literally buckets of them uh, far too many to sit here all day talking about but as I said I'll list them up as we go we've got EQ models uh, line 6 original or MXR we've got modulation models fender optical tremolo MXRs shine shine L univibes love univibes Ada flanges line 6 original boss CE ones VB2s Leslie's Dynamics models, Line 6 original, MXR, tele, Teletronics, LA28, and on and on these go. Uh, there's a couple of pages here. And uh, delay models, reverb models, pitch synth, filter models, wah models. We've got 1, 2, 3, 6. We've got 10 wahs, different types of wah that we can apply in here. It's awesome stuff. Uh, volume and pan models. We've got some further down, we've got some uh, common FX settings that you can use, uh, you know, to get you going and uh, to get you a bit in the way of thinking that you have to think with one of these units. Because if you don't think this way, <laughs> just stick to the presets. <laughs> I'm still going to be putting up on the screen uh, other things that we talk about here. And I'm currently in this section for amps and cabs. Well, you know what amps do to sound. Uh, most people know if you go and get a different amp, you sound different through the same cab. But some people don't know. Uh, some people are not so uh, switched on to understand that when you change a cab, uh, your sound changes as well. Now, in this unit, uh, they use a thing called an IR. And these IRs you can load in. And what they are effectively is they like a... Think of it like settings that this can use to simulate a particular cab and maybe microphone and things like that so built into it uh, which is good <laughs> a, a, a pile of uh, amps and cabs now looking at the amps we've got high watt dr103 supro gibson eh185 fender basement fender champ fender deluxes number of them silvertone dr z route 66 JC120, AC15, ACs, Marshall 45s, JTM45, Marshall Super Leads, more amp models down here, Park 75s, Bogner Shiva, Mesa Boogie Dual Rec, Engel Fireball, Soldano Slow 100s, three settings for that, PV5150, Ampegs, Mesa Boogie Base 400s, uh, Galleon Kruger, these are bass stuff as well. So we've got bass amps, and then we move on to cab models. The very thing what we were talking about. One of the things you do want to know is that uh, with these cab models, you can have a single cab or a dual cab. Obviously, if you're using a dual cab, it's going to take up uh, really double the DSP power. Uh, so a single cab's probably a good idea. <laughs> I did show you earlier how to change that cab uh, when we looked at one of the amps, and uh, it's not really difficult to do. Now, you've got... Uh, a number of cabs in here, I don't know exactly how many, let's say 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 8, there's 25 or 30 by the work of it. I'm not going to go through the, all the exact specifications, but some people have said, well, there's not enough. I want more. Well, guess what? Because you're using these IRs, these, these files, 
that uh, simulate a cab, you can go and get IRs really from anywhere and uh, when you pull them in uh, they'll do that simulation of that cab just as if they were in any other program. I guess that's one of the good things about it. So you're not limited to just what uh, Line 6 supply you. You have this sort of open-ended thing and I'm sure that if you get on the Line 6 forum, which I don't usually go to forums, but let's assume you do, uh, I'm sure they'll be sharing all the IRs out uh, all day. Sounds good to me. Sounds a plan. Just so it's perfectly clear for those techie boys, it does actually tell you in here, impulse response IR. Impulse responses are mathematical functions representing the sonic measurements of specific audio systems for Helix, speaker cabinet and microphone combinations. Helix can load and store up to 128 custom or third party IRs at a time. So 128 is your maximum limit. It's more than I'll ever need. I, I use a 1968 out there and that's about it. <laughs> it's rock and roll, man. You know earlier we were talking about, when we looked at the back of the unit, about those send and returns, those four send and returns. Well, there's a little section in the manual here, and this is one of the reasons why you really need to print it out. Uh, so you can get in your head what this is all about. What you've got here is, on these FX loop settings, uh, among other things, one of the things that I did like to see, uh, was you can have trails on or trails off. What that really means is, in case you don't know, uh, let's imagine you've got a delay going bump. Bump, bump, bump. Well, if you switch channels to a channel that doesn't have a delay or doesn't have any effect like that, you can have them trails go bump, bump, oh, it's gone. <laughs> With this, you can flip it so that those trails trail off even though you've changed channels. So it's a nice, smooth uh, and simple, uh, oh, great sound, in fact. You can turn them on and off. Uh, as is the send and returns, uh, the FX loops let you dynamically insert your external stomp boxes or rack effects, it says here. Well, that's great. I've got a rack. I'll be putting the rack into one of those, or maybe two of them. Or maybe using some of those other connections on the back, uh, which uh, I could. Another thing that's useful in this unit, if you like that sort of thing, is a looper. Now, the thing is about loopers, when you're putting them in here, uh, and you're putting your little block in, you can have one stereo or one mono. doesn't matter which, I guess, but uh, you can only have one. Just remember that. Now I'm going to whiz the camera back again so we can have another look at some more features, but I just wanted to talk about the blocks and that sort of thing, just so you get it more clear in your mind. Uh, it's not rocket science, but in the same context, you are limited somewhat by the DSP power, as indeed you are with every other one on the market, every other product, that is. They all have similar limitations. What I'm going to do is show you how to take this effect here and assign it to a, 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 a pedal or a switch, should I say, not a pedal. So what we need to do is to get this into, into the uh, stomp mode. When we're in the stomp mode, you just take something that's empty. Well, you can assign it to one that's there, but I'm not going to do that. Look, it's trying already. Touch. And it appears. Now, if I want to assign that, I can literally just say, OK, on that button and away you go. I'm not going to assign it because I don't need to, but that's how simple it is. And of course you can come back out of this, back to your original thing if you want to be in that mode. So preset or stomp mode. You can also do this in another way where if you go into the menu mode, footswitch assign, you simply turn this knob to set it to whichever footswitch you want. Okay. Bam, job done. I'm not going to do it, but that's how you do do it. Simple. By the way, one thing I didn't mention is each one of these foot switches can have up to eight assignments. Oh, and while we were in the assign mode for the foot switches, let's go back to that and do that. It's possible we can go and customize foot switch four. One, two, three, four. Let's go and customize foot switch three. Nothing any. We press that. We can then change, the, uh, we're on this one, sorry. We can go and change that to any uh, representation we want. It's all pretty simple. I'm not going to sit here twiddling knobs, you know what to do. One thing I did just do was to add a, a wah pedal here, fazzle, or fassel, or fazel, depends how you say it, where you're from. Well, there it is. Um, when I've added that, you can see down here that you can set the position uh, the low position of the foot controller, the high position, 
the mix and the level of it. And one of the things is, you know, if you wanted to do uh, what some guys did and have your wire in a particular position, it's all very easy to move it to a particular position for that particular uh, sound. And you could be just uh, playing awesome then. I had a few guys do that. Actually, I bought a pedal recently uh, called the, uh, the Freak, something like that. And uh, that does that. Here it is. You don't need to buy the pedal. Oh, by the way, if you just add a, uh, a wah, like I did, it's automatically applied to expression one. So what we'd need to do is toe down uh, on the pedal to get to expression one, and then you're in it. Expression two could be anything else you want it to be. In this case, it's selected to expression two, but I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> one of the great things is, uh, instead of using this for anything in particular, don't forget you've got those external uh, expression pedals. There's at least two of them out there. And you can assign any of these things uh, to be a variable, uh, actually, uh, to the expression pedal. And you'll have similar things to this that you can tweak and cut and carve. It's all very good and all very simple. And that's the thing about this. This particular uh, unit is not difficult to learn. There's a quick controller assignment and a, a manual controller assignment. Uh, I just put the wire in and it's already there. Now I'm not going to spend all day getting another expression pedal out and faffing around like that. You'll pick it up easy. Tr just trust me. Oh, and by the way, there's an easy enough way uh, involved in clearing the controller assignment. Uh, so if you get it wrong, you can clear it off and start again. There's another feature built right into the, uh, the Helix uh, that I like, and it's very easy to get at. It's called the Command Center. All we do is click this and whiz off into command center here. Now what have we got? Well, you know that it's a MIDI device. And um, on this device, by the way, let me just digress a second, MIDI is transmitted through the serial as well as the MIDI port. So it doesn't matter which way around you do it, you're gonna get those uh, commands going out there. But looking at this here, this little uh, lightning flash, you'll see it. The lightning flash is all about instant transmissions or instant messages right so you're able to send uh in fact up to about i think it's eight uh oh, six of these instant midi commands out now in my case that could be really good because i've got a rack full of equipment and I, 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 in that rack i use a, a ground control gcx so the gcx can receive midi from this uh, instantly when I press this, right, when I press this preset. Now, that's a, that's a useful thing, just trust me on this. So I'm able to choose other effects externally that might actually be in the, uh, you know, the uh, serial loops that we've got here. And uh, everything will switch all at once. It's all very nice. But as well as that, you've got these other uh, buttons that are described there, you can see them there, uh, that you can also send MIDI out of. I'll just show you quickly uh, how we do this. I'm not going to go into great depths about MIDI, but uh, you'll figure that out yourself. Let's imagine we wanted to uh, send a command out on this one here that's an instant. We can just choose this uh, preset editor and we can twizzle it round. And you can see we've got a load of different things that we can put in there. So we could say MIDI channel this, MIDI channel that, this, that the other basically i'm not going to change it but you could it's equally just as easy to set that particular foot switch up with all this stuff as well all very simple a massive massive uh important aspect of having uh, a pedal like this uh, it will replace things like uh you know the ground control and things like that it, it in effect makes it easier, uh, much easier by using the MIDI uh, control. I could cover a whole uh, video uh, regarding this command center. There really is so much you could do with it, you know, switching this, switching that. Uh, it's just beyond what I'm uh, going to put in this video. This video is long enough to start off with. Now most of the uh, labeling that we've already discussed, and I showed you how you could change one of those uh, titles 
it's all pretty much applicable to most of the things. So, you know, when, you, when you're doing this renaming, uh, yeah, you get to the save section, of course you can rename it. When you get to this section where you're editing this, of course you can rename it. There's very little that you can't actually rename on the unit. Obviously you couldn't edit position or FC4, that's something else, but that's in the system. But all these other things that you could change, well, you can change, <laughs> which I think is uh, pretty cool. Another thing we've got in the unit is the thing called a global EQ. Now that can be useful uh, for, you know, really tailoring that final sound out. And it's got three uh, parametric and uh, a low and a high filter. So we can compensate for disparity in acoustic, uh, you know, when you're out on the stage in different places, they sound different. So you can fix it by using this uh, global parameter. It's simple to get at, you just do that and you choose global EQ. Here they are all along the bottom. We can do all that stuff. Put that in like that. So once we have the parameters, we want them in this global EQ, any one of the three, in fact, uh, all you need to do is to go up to bypass and press that and you'll see that it appears up in the corners. We go back to the home screen. You'll see it sits up there now. Now, if you press bypass here, it doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't turn on and off global EQ. You have to go back into there back into this, and then you can turn it on or off. I'll leave it off for now. I have another section that's uh, quite important. We just whiz into the menu system, into global settings. This covers the ins and the outs, MIDI tempo, foot switches, displays, info, I think there's some more. Oh, it's just the bottom. Well, as you can see, there's a whole pile of them, ins and outs, MIDI tempo, as I said, foot switches, displays, info, and so on. We can whiz across them like this. Same old system, same old thing. So when we come down here, you've got these down here looking after the ins and the outs. I won't talk about them all day because there really is that many. Oh, info, firmware, fancy that. <laughs> On this ins and outs, there are three pages. I'll let you look at those as we go nice and slowly. So we can change these to anything we want them to be. Wine, instrument, quarter outputs whatever you fancy. All pretty simple. In fact, it's uh, there's an extreme amount of things that you can change in there for the ins, the outs, the mic in, phantom, uh, voltages, the gain, the mic low cut, USB, uh, quarter inch outputs, XRs, send and returns, that's where you do it. There's reamp sourcing in there, USB 7 and 8. Uh, volume knob controls, headphone monitor, digital output, uh, sample rates, on and on it goes, MIDI tempo, uh, foot switches, you've got uh, touch select, preset mode selected, stomp switches, up and down switches, displays, you've got LED ring brightness, tap tempo LEDs, all sorts of things, on and on it goes. Now another thing you can do uh, with this product is you can uh, stream USB audio out uh, into a door. I don't mean a wooden door. <laughs> I mean a door, you know, a recorder on your PC. Lots of people do that. Uh, I tend not to, but that's not a problem. Uh, I know where I'm going with it, typically. So you can have uh, hardware monitoring of this audio, or you could have door software monitoring. So there's quite a number of things you can do with it. In any case, the, the Helix do, default multi-settings for both the input and the output blocks provides hardware monitoring. That allows you to hear your live input signal all the time, uh, independent of your door software monitor settings. Hardware monitoring can be desirable since it allows you to hear your live gear and mix input with Helix processing uh, added and essentially latency free. And that's the important bit, latency free, since the monitor signal isn't routed through your door software. These are uh, set up through the global settings as well, don't forget that. Another thing that uh, the unit's got is DI recording, you know. That's uh, like uh, basically where you might play your guitar and you've got your distortion on, but what actually gets recorded is like a clean guitar. Uh, it's not uncommon to use things like plugins in your door software, you know, to get that amp back and things like that. Or you could resend it back out to this uh, at a later time and uh, reamp it. They call it reamping. Uh, so you could choose a different amp 
that suits the track may be better later. Obviously, if you record uh, a sound that is the uh, incorrect sound for that particular track, later on, you're stuck, aren't you? You've got that sound and you've got that sound. But if you record it clean, uh, well, you're able then later to, to do this reamping thing and choose a different amp and stuff like that. It's not an uncommon practice, but I tend to get it right first time when I do the recording on my studio. <laughs> I don't know why those guys are so persistent, but they are. And uh, this unit will do that quite easily. Well, hey, listen, I'm not an Apple guy. I, I, I don't particularly use Apple computers, but uh, if you're using Windows, you'll need the ASIO or ASIO driver, set, uh, driver software, really. And I think it's... Uh, downloadable from line6.com slash uh, software. I think that's where it comes from. You can download it for free. You'll need to use that really uh, if it isn't in your door software already, uh, which it may be. But if it isn't, don't forget I said it because <laughs> you'll come unstuck if you don't use uh, the correct stuff. We are coming to the end of the on-screen demo. Uh, there's a few things I do want to still talk about uh, relating to MIDI actually. Uh, MIDI banks and program changes. Helix responds to traditional MIDI bank and program change messages from an external MIDI controller device or from MIDI software via USB and it will recall the set list and all presets accordingly. And it's nice to be able to actually change the preset list or the set list uh, with MIDI. Uh, and you can load it remotely basically from your MIDI controller device, send a bank change CC32 which is OSB, message with a value of zero for set list one or one for set list two, etc. You know, three for set list three and, and so on. Followed by a program change message uh, for preset 01A to 32D for the desired preset within that set list. So you can choose the set list and then you can choose the actual uh, preset. It's also possible to load a preset within the current set list. And you can do that with MIDI too. I won't bore you too much with it because there's a load of parameters in MIDI uh, that this thing supports uh, both in and out. And uh, it's beyond the scope of a, a sort of regular review. Uh, you could get to the point where you're teaching people MIDI. I don't want to do that. <sighs> I'm back. <laughs> well, that's a bit of a, an overview about the uh, Line 6 Helix. Probably in a different way than most people are going to show you. But don't worry. I've showed you the inside, the outside. The whole damn thing, as they said in Jaws. That's what you want, isn't it? The truth. Now, you know, right from the offset, when I ordered this back in August, it must have been August or maybe even before, uh, I looked at this unit and I thought, hmm, it looks like it could be good, especially since Yamaha bought out Line 6. Now, Line 6 will tell you, oh, we've been on it for years. Well, I'm sure they have, but... Uh, this product has more of a feel. If you want the truth, it has more of a feel of a Yamaha product than it does a Line 6 product. I mean, man, I remember the days of the old Line 6 products and uh, I wasn't that impressed, you know. Uh, the pilot's handbook may be crash and burn, like I said. Uh, and the rest of it, the sounds weren't, just weren't that right. Uh, and with this unit, uh, you know, even through your headphones, I mean, it sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm impressed with it to start off with. What I really like about it, though, is that this thing uh, will integrate, for me, into the rack I've got. It could integrate for you into the pedals you've got. And we've got all these uh, titles that we can change. We've got the, the external control uh, is a massive, massive uh, important thing. And that, this will allow me to get rid of one of my regular uh, control pedals and put this in its place. Now, the fact that I've got all those effects and amplifiers uh, and speaker caps, excuse me, if I want them, uh, well, that's great. Uh, I can even turn the amps off if I want to turn the amps off. I can have clean outs. I can have it just as an effects unit, which is also great. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, when you look at these simulators, emulators, some of those sounds that they have aren't that great. And people say to me, ah, oh, yeah, but Tony, you can, you can tweak it. Well, listen, I don't want to sit there for you know, the next 30 days arriving at 10 sounds when I can get it in 30 seconds on a tube amp. That's not what it's about. What this is about, or appears to be about, is it makes it rather more simpler 
than the other things I've seen. Uh, I have to say that the Kemper isn't too bad. I think the other one, I only even mentioned it, uh, that's not too good. You could sit there for months on that thing. But this one, I, I seem to have a bit of a vibe for. I think the only thing you've got to really pick up on is the understanding of these little icons and which ones they are. You know, many of them look pretty similar to me. But, you know, once you highlight it and you press it, you can go and tweak it around a bit and, uh, and away you go. Uh, I also like those external uh, controllers uh, because I, I do that on the regular floor pedal I have at the moment. So, for me, this unit's going to fit probably straight in to what I want it to do. I might turn those amps off, like I said. I might even turn the cabs off as well. I'm going to turn cabs off. Look, some cab will be in it, maybe. But, uh, yeah, it all looks good. Well, where do we go from here? Well, where I go from here, where you should go from here, is to, uh, first of all, my YouTube channel, which is there. Yeah, www.youtube.com slash Tony McKenzie com, no dot. Well, when you get fed up with that, you can go to my www.tonymckenzie.com website. And uh, I'll be writing this review subsequent to completing the video. It takes a while to do these videos, especially when you're getting inside looking at the guts. And, uh, you know, we've got that to cover yet. Uh, in, the, in the review, uh, this review, well, it'll skim over what those chips are. You've probably seen that already. But in the real review, the one on my website, it won't skim over them. It'll compare them with a number of other things, which I know some people don't love. Yeah, especially the dual processor action bit. I love that. A dual processor for a great price too. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to whiz this out into the studio. Uh, I'm going to play a few sounds that are in here, presets that are in here. Just, just play anything on them really, just to give you an idea of what they sound like. And then I'll probably stick a track on the end if I feel like it. And I won't if I don't. But in either case, you're going to get an idea of what this thing sounds like in reality, as opposed to what some manufacturer is trying to sell it to you as. You know what they like. <laughs> you get it. I get it. It sounds nothing like what it does on them, uh, them videos. Oh, I hate them. That's why I started doing this. Yeah. So how would I rate this product? Well, bear in mind... It's not a cheap product. This costs about eleven hundred pounds or sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. But you do get everything with it. Well, you don't get a printed manual. That's true. But you do get a manual. You get a little memory stick. You even get an adjuster to adjust the the, uh, the pressure on the pedal. You get a USB cable. Not surprising. You get that simple. Let's uh, get going fast mode. Little print off over there. And you get one or two other bits and pieces. So. Uh, it offers a lot for a small amount, and I'm sure that as it moves forward, that uh, Line 6 will be bringing out loads and loads of additions of stuff. Because they can. Uh, it's that simple. So, yeah, this one, it gets a 10 out of 10. What about that? And I like tube amps. <laughs> it does get a 10 out of 10. I wouldn't say that it's going to be perfect uh, on every single tube amp that's in there. You know, an exact sound. It isn't. But this particular one, this Brit Plexi Bright, uh, really was a Brit Plexi Bright. It was a Marshall. Let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> so, hey, Marshall, watch out. I hope you are working on something too. One last thing. <laughs> I thought I'd do an apple on you. <laughs> uh, up and coming is uh, a Fender Supersonic 22. That's coming up for review. I've got uh, a Decimator 2 pedal. That's coming up for review. That's quite interesting if you've never seen one or never used one. I've got uh, a thing called a trio coming up which is quite nice and you can sack all your band members and you can put this pedal on and uh, basically it'll play to you which I thought was quite funny really and you know I saw the Andertons uh, review and I didn't think that it sounded as bad by any means as what Andertons made out. Uh, in fact uh, a lot of guys I'm sure will buy them. Uh, yeah, interesting. I've got some other effects pedals and things coming as well. And, uh, oh, don't forget I've got that Gibson Custom uh, custom Sharp uh, Quilt Top uh, to come to. Uh, that's coming on as a, a sort of close-up review. It's all coming soon. So anyway, here's the plane. Yeah, it is that way. <laughs> here's the plane. 
and uh, I'll see you soon.
Well, there you have it. Uh, a mix of sounds that uh, the Helix has. And uh, there's many, many more. You know, you just run out of time doing all this sort of stuff. And I uh, hope it's been a, a review you might, uh, you might like somewhat. It's taken me a, a number of days to do this, uh, this review. So, enjoy. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, in case you're thinking, I got the t-shirt from Walmart for $4. <laughs>